All righty then. Can everyone hear me? Just stick up a thumbs up if you can see and hear me. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to this um, afternoon's panel discussion. My name is Abigail Arunga. Uh, today the panel that we are going to have you watch us on is called Objects in Conversation on the importance of restitution to respective societies. Like I said, my name is Abigail Arunga. I'm a writer, blogger, and columnist based in Nairobi, Kenya. On the panel with me, um, and I will let them introduce themselves eventually, are um, Elena Schilling and Saita Bao Kayare, whose uh, film is kind of the root of our discussion today. The film is called If Objects Could Speak. We will also be in conversation with Njeri Gashishi and Chao, yes, hi, <laughs> and uh, Chao Tayana Mina, uh, who has just gotten on the screen. I feel like I should have matched your energy with the African artifacts today. I'm failing right now, but but we'll get to it. I got my comb earrings at the very least. Um, yeah, so thank you guys all for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for making the movie and thank you for being willing to discuss the movie itself and everything that surrounds it. Um, before we launched into this action-packed discussion, I just want to uh, make sure that everyone is aware that this is an initiative of the European Film Festival, which you can watch on all of the social media pages. The views that we're talking about today um, are not necessarily the views of the European Film Festival, but we thank them for giving us the space to discuss it anyway. Um, I think if everyone's gone to the bathroom and we're all good to go, I think we can just launch into it, right? Um, if you have any comments for me, feel free to um, address them to me on the side or use a smoke signal. We are in Africa. Do what you need to do. Right. So I'm super excited. First of all, uh, this movie, If Objects Could Speak, I mean, it's so pertinent. It's so timely. I know it's kind of a weird time to be talking about bringing things back to Africa um, in the middle of a pandemic when nothing is going anywhere. But I think it's... Um, obviously uh, important to talk about, first of all, maybe you can start us off, Elena, on what made you and Saitabao kind of think of doing this movie in the first place. And then Saitabao, you can give your comments and then I can ask you searching questions about what we're talking about today. Hello, everybody. My name is Elena, I'm one of the two directors. So thanks for having us, for inviting us to this panel and also for having us our film. Um, yes, what made us do the film? So basically both of us were joining an exchange program and um, it was from the Film Academy where I study and from Tuku Box East Africa and Robert Bosch Foundation. And they asked us to do a project that um, deals with both countries, Kenya and Germany. So um, it had two directors and we both were looking for something that connects our countries in a more organic way than just making something up um, ourselves. And this was the period of time where this um, restitution debate was quite big in the media. So it, um, I think now it's changed already, but it, in the time of 2018 in the autumn where we started, it was quite a big thing. So it um, just catched our interest um, in immediately. And that's why how we started doing it. So maybe Saturday can add something. Uh, yeah, um, just to add on what, uh, oh, hello everyone. My name is Saitabao Kayare. Uh, just as Elena said, um, yeah, we began this project quite a while. It took us almost uh, uh, almost one year to do the entire film. And uh, at the height of the conversation about repatriation and restitution, uh, for us, we decided sort of to do it differently because normally the conversation is always from a sort of elitist and expert level. So then we decided sort of to take an object quote unquote, um, uh, not physically, but also just to take using the AR and the digital copy to take it to the people uh, in order to find out what the object was, what it means to them, and if they would want uh, the objects to come back. So it was more like a starting a discussion from the very grassroots level. I get that. So the year that it took you guys to kind of get the concept of and do the things that you needed to do to make the film is what took one year? Or is it the actual shooting? Because it looked like if you had to do the actual 
going from Germany to Kenya to do the installation involved that we see in the film, that is what would take the significant amount of time, right? Yes, we started uh, the research in the autumn of 2018 and we finished the whole production in January of 2020. And actual shooting part was between, I think, January 2019 until summer, like half, half a year, the period of half a year. Yeah. How did you guys pick the object? Um, Sai Sabao, I know you say in the movie, um, your uh, Kenyan with Kikuyu roots. So were you deliberately looking for a Kikuyu artifact so that it would be easier for you to kind of go back home and, and, and do research and kind of uncover what that object was because you were already from there? Because you speak the language, you can easily kind of go back and explore that. Uh, yeah, just to, uh, we were also looking something close to that, but uh, when we came in particularly to choosing this object, uh, there were various factors that needed to be involved. For example, because we were sort of creating a digital scan and based on the material and the shape, we had to look for an object that would be very easy to uh, replicate and reproduce because uh, some objects are, you're not able to sort of uh, do the whole photogrammetry and um, um, replicate it in digital form. So the material and the object was important, but also for us, uh, not only just because because I have roots, but we also wanted um, to find an object that has no story uh, because if you see clearly, uh, it has little information and little data and uh, from the museum, uh, they say this object entered in 1903 and they know the collector's name and there's not so much information about it. So for us as filmmakers, we were curious because we felt this is an opportunity to explore and uh, uh, find out what this object and tell a very meaningful and impactful story. Um, you've said something interesting there that I would kind of like to ask um, Jerry's input on. So, and Jerry, you all work um, closely with things that have to do with invisible inventories and things that are in other museums, but are from Kenya. In terms of artifacts that are held in the National Museums of Kenya, do you generally know where everything is from? Thank you very much, uh, Abigail and Tim. Um, as you've said, my name is Jerry Gashi, and uh, yeah, I do work with the National Museums of Kenya and uh, currently on a project called the Invis uh, Invisible Inventory Program, which is currently running an exhibition in Nairobi called the Invisible Inventories. And that's a very interesting question when you ask a question whether we know everything that we have within our collections. But if I said that, I would be definitely lying. Uh, with our collection, which is yeah, I, more than a million objects, you know, bearing in mind we have a natural history collection, we have uh, the uh, earth sciences collection, which has the archaeology and the paleontology, uh, we have the cultural heritage collection. It's not everything that we can surely say that we know um, everything about it. What happens is that even as a museum, we, we are always discovering. Um, at times, we even find ourselves in a situation where we have to, like, um, kind of seem to be changing the whole narrative about an object. Remember the collections we have were um, collected also, most of them, we have a very good number of them that were collected during the colonial period. So the collectors were also uh, visitors to our own country. Uh, we have them giving names to communities or even to objects that we can currently say they are derogatory, like terms that Anuronga used. Uh, so at times, it's always times when you get to the, like I can use an example of the cultural heritage collection, a storage, you go there and I mean, every time you go into that store, you can always like almost discover something, come across something. And, uh, and I'm talking this from my experience uh, as, as, a, as, an, as an anthropologist, as a museologist, and also as a Kenyan community member. I've been to that collection and found something that said it was for my community and I could not relate to it. And the mm -hmm. same, like the name will kind of, you know, you know, uh, give you a different kind of, you know, story from what you expect to find. At times the image you find may be different from what you are used to outside there. That is completely true. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because even in the film, if objects could speak, at the end of the film, they discover the cultural historic name of the object that they were trying to bring back to Kenya. And I was going 
to feel like death if you hadn't found it out, Elena and Saitaba. So thank you for finding it out because it, it was like a, it was like a mystery film. Like all of the younger people that you were asking didn't know the name of this object. They didn't know where it was from. They had never seen it before. I was trying to guess earlier in the movie, was it a weapon? Did they used to stuff things inside it and blow it like a poisoned arrow? I was very curious um, towards the end of the movie, what the movie was, um, what the object actually was. And maybe that's where I can bring um, your views in, Chow. Sorry to <laughs> interrupt your cup of tea, I apologize. Um, Saitaba also mentioned that they had to pick an object that was easy to kind of reconfigure. I don't know what, what to call it, to reconfigure into um, virtual reality so that when they took it, people could see it when they were looking on the installation on the, on the iPad. Is that something that's important to check for in terms of how we can create virtual exhibitions for um, those people who cannot physically access, which is another irony we're going to get to, people who cannot physically access their own objects of tradition. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Chao Maina. I am a digital humanities scholar and a digital heritage specialist based in Nairobi. Um, as Abigail has mentioned, my work looks at the intersection of technology and culture and particularly um, looking at aspects such as digitization and digital archiving. So to answer your question with regards to what, whether it's important to look at you know, the nature of the object, it is extremely important. I think one of the rules or one of the things that um, I always say with regards to digitization is that the cultural record is a priority. So you have to understand the record, understand the material, understand its shape, its size, it's the things that make this cultural object or record what it is, and then that determines what form of digitization you will use. So some modes of digitization work better for others. So for example, if an object is too fragile, you'd want to go for a method of digitization that doesn't require a lot of handling. Whereas if it's made of certain materials, you can go for a different thing. So this is definitely a priority, but at the same time, I think the cultural object and the cultural artifact is is the center of attention, literally. And, and that's what we, we align our technology and our modes of dissemination to. Okay, which brings to answer me to the first question. question. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, in terms of uh, the object being the center of attention, like you just said, so maybe you're the one that I should ask, is digitization of these objects a valid or sustainable method of restitution? in your opinion, in your professional digital humanist opinion, is it valid and sustainable um, institution? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that digitization is a substitute for restitution. So that's the first thing. I don't, I, I, I completely, I'm very clear about saying that digitization is not a substitute for physical restitution. However, it can be a catalyst towards physical restitution in the sense that if we don't know what objects are there, it's very hard to put like a, what I'd, I'd say a face to the object, yeah? So digitization sort of breaks the barrier of access in the sense that now we know it's not just abstract objects that are out there, it's this particular object from this particular community that looks this in this way. And that's what digitization does in terms of facilitating our understanding and our reach and our knowledge of the object. I don't see them as, um, antagonizing each other. If anything, I feel that we should look at digitization and physical restitution as part of the same process in that we are working towards physical restitution. And as we work towards that, we also need to think about how is this information accessible online? Because we know that a majority of people come to online spaces and digital spaces as their first point of research, as their first point of contact. So whether we, we, we are looking at um, physical restitution, digital restitution is not a substitute, but something that should enable conversation, should enable dialogue, and should enable access to understanding while we work towards um, physical restitution. Because in essence, what we are saying is that the, the tangibility of the object and the tactile nature of what these artifacts mean is also as equally important as the knowledge of the object itself. This is very true. I have about 26 different questions from everything all of you have said. I don't know. I don't know if they can add us another three hours. I'm going to just try and pack the knowledge as quickly as I possibly can. Um, Charles, something you said reminded me of something um, in the film as well, where um, I think when you guys were, when you had the installation with the digital object outside, um, was it KCC? I'm not sure. It was somewhere in town. And then 
uh, you were talking to a, a policeman, an Askari, and he was like, if these things are ours, they should be brought back. But someone else, another guy was like, did you guys just know that these objects were here? Or did you go and find them? How did that make you guys feel? Like the fact that people don't even know our objects are out there and they're asking you, how did you guys know that these were there? Did you just walk in? Because, you know, for a normal Kenyan, the process of walking into, you know, a university, I mean, a museum in Germany is not, it's not a possible thing. How did that make you guys feel? Maybe Saitabo, you can answer that one. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was very interesting, especially getting such opinion and um, uh, getting such insight because people, um, there's a sort of uh, missing kind of knowledge about when it comes to uh, traditional knowledge systems, uh, especially in what in our education system and also uh, that's not taught in history because there's a whole chapter about objects and their use that is it's missing. And uh, for us, uh, when we were doing uh, research with Elena, we got to interact with uh, a number of museums. We walked in into a lot of museums, but we are mostly grateful to um, uh, Dr. Sandra Ferracuti, who, uh, who was back then the uh, curator at the Stuttgart Museum, the Linden Museum, because uh, she was willing to, you know, have this conversation and give us access to be able to, you know, look at their storage and uh, cellars and just to find these objects. But in uh, going back to um, how Kenyans, how this knowledge is missing, it means that there's a lot that needs to be done, you know, in terms of knowledge provenance, knowledge research, and especially uh, making people aware about such a subject. Mm. Um, Elena, at the end of the movie, you said something very interesting. You said, now that you had come to the end of the journey, uh, and you felt like you had found the answer, yes, there were many objects that were still in foreign museums, but all was not lost. Do you feel like, I had a question about that particular statement because there's so much that has actually been lost to foreign museums. So maybe you can kind of expound on what exactly you meant by that statement because when you're watching the movie, it kind of feels like this is an object, for example, from the Stuttgart Museum. There's many other museums that have many more, millions more objects that we don't even know about and can't possibly know about. So did you mean like all is not lost in terms of at least the journey has begun? Yes, um, the journey has begun. So um, we just found one story. And like you said, there are so many millions of stories and the people who might remember things, they will not be there forever. So what um, also is really important that um, these things are, the stories are still there, but somebody needs to tell them and to find them, but soon they will be also disappear. So as long as people are alive who um, have memories who remember um, this is what's what's left but it's not it has no really representation so it, it needs to be more put into focus and um, that's what I think adding to the term of um, to, to the topic of digitalization I would add that um, I really like the thought that we start digitizing things but um, we in Europe we keep them <laughs> digitized and we give back the original so this is what um, I think digitizing objects and giving them back as digitized um, versions is so wrong in so many ways. But I think if we would keep, keep them here so people like me could watch them uh, for, from wherever, but the original goes back, like um, I think this is something we might think about because it's possible, like we, we did it. And um, yeah, I, I would just bring it to the table that living in 2021, um, like in, in our, and this year with these possibilities, we really can do a shift, um, yeah, do a shift and change some things in this discussion. I hope um, that answers um, your question. Yes, it does. And it brings me to another question, actually, and this is for Njeri and the National Museums of Kenya. If so, in the Invisible Inventories program, which you're a part of, um, the collectives that were involved and all the historians and museum workers from um, Germany who were involved counted, I think it's 32,000 objects. Is it 32,000? Please correct me if I'm wrong, it's 32,000. Um, and they listed all these objects and you know we managed to see a couple in the exhibition and it was fantastic. But these are 32,000 that we know of. 
let's give a ballpark figure. Maybe in the world, there's 2 million objects of Kenyan history. If we brought them back, where would we put them? Wow, that's a very interesting uh, question, uh, uh, Abigail. Um, and it's a question that comes keeps coming up whenever we've had this conversation. Uh, for those who may not know, the uh, IIP has been uh, a program running for the last uh, three years. And uh, we were established, we came together to do what is called the provenance research and look through uh, what is held in museums abroad. Uh, we have been looking keenly in, uh, uh, say, Europe and North America. That is not everyone that has Kenyan objects, of course, but that's where we began. And yeah, as you're saying, when that number comes up, people think it's really so much, but definitely uh, we, we have so many other objects out there. So it's something that we began and 50,000 is just like a tip of the iceberg. And of course, some of these objects, we have had conversations with the community when we were doing community voices and, and knowing what people would like to see or what their views are. But one thing that comes out, which is not really unexpected is that National Museums of Kenya is not the owner of these projects. We hold the objects in trust on behalf of the community. So even when you're talking about restitution, we cannot restitute objects and ask for them on behalf of the community. We can do capacity building, we can set up platforms, we can encourage and help in you know, setting up whatever it is or even asking for them, but we cannot ask for them because the objects do not belong to the National Museums of Kenya. Objects were taken from Pokomo people, for instance, the Pokomo drum were taken from the community. So the community should be the ones to ask for the objects. And when we ask them those questions, of course, when you talk about these objects, some of them that are very you know, sacred and so dear to the people, they already know where they would want to see these objects. And uh, they are uh, coming up with ideas and thinking of ways in which they can set up their own centers to collect these objects because uh, when they are down there where the community is, they feel that they could be, they'll be closer to them and they'll be more visible. Uh, let me also mention that the issue of invisibility at times is not only out there, it's not only an issue of what is abroad and of, of the national invisibility. Invisibility can also be national. We can have, and we have had cases where uh, communities feel that objects are better with them and they are more dear and closer to them than when they are with the National Museums of Kenya. Okay, I, I did not know that certain aspect that you said where the museums hold it in trust and the National Museums are not the ones who are in charge of going to retrieve those items, but doesn't it, um, doesn't it make more sense to form like a unified kind of appeal? Like are all tribes of Kenya supposed to now identify restitution officers and then join with the National Museums of Kenya to ask for these things? Because I know there've been segmented attempts to get to these articles, right? So like the, the head of Kwetala Larab Samui, for example, they've been asking for that for years. Other things like the way you said the Pokomo drum, who is supposed to ask for the carcasses of the man-eating lions of Savo? You know, like how, what would be a concerted, how do you concert that effort? Is it the government? I don't know. You, you tell me. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very you know, valid question. And it's a question that we always have to like keep asking ourselves. We are not running away from the business of restitution. We can never run away from the issues of restitution at all. Remember, uh, the government has a responsibility of setting up policies uh, so that whatever it is you're talking about can be acquired. We can assist these communities. We have to work with them. We have to support. And uh, of course, right, right now, we already have what we've called even within the exhibition, the objects of national importance. We do have objects that it is known. We've had the president speak and saying that the community communities of a certain uh, area, like for instance, the head of Koitara uh, Arab Samoy is one of those that are listed that are what we call objects of national importance. Indeed, National Museums of Kenya cannot run away from the responsibility. What we are saying is that even when we ask, we will be asking on behalf of the community. We will be doing it together with the community. That's the one thing that needs to be very clear. Because uh, as you're saying, uh, I know there's the issue of the fact that those objects are held in institutions. So it's always easier to have an institution speak to an institution. But remember, these objects were taken under state leadership. So of course, 
Kenya as a country, the government cannot run away from the issue of saying, you know, we have we have to assist these people so, so that they can be able to ask for what they need. So the government and the National Museums of Kenya as a whole, we have a responsibility of ensuring that we, we do what we call sensitization. We cannot run away from that responsibility. We have to inform. That's why we are running this program. We have to make sure that Kenyans are aware of what is out there. And we're very, very grateful for other institutions right, right now. Oh, I mean, uh, our colleagues, uh, say Tabao and Elena, and of course, Chow and everybody else who's getting into this business and, you know, and, and saying this has to be spoken. NMK can always provide the platform. And of course, we will always support. I get that. Noted, I have a couple of council of elders I need to speak to. Um, Child, there's something very interesting that you said about um, digitization, just to go back to what you said about how digitization is not substitution, even though it feels like sometimes people are using it as that. So what is the role, I think my question is, what is the role of digitization in the restitution process? Maybe to expand on, is it to go after and list all of the things that are being held and provide like digital images of it so that we know what we're looking for and attach the stories as we get the objects? Is it to keep a record of um, the Council of Elders and the National Museums of Kenya and all the governments who are trying to um, get those things back? Because I mean, in the process of restitution, there are letters that are sent, there are emissaries that are sent and, and, and those need to be documented and concluded. Maybe you can expand a little bit on what you feel the role of digitization is in restitution or even what you feel you've been doing also in the role of restitution. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Thanks, Abigail. Um, I love the question because oftentimes when we speak about digitization, we we often assume that it's just digitization of the artifact or the archive or the object itself. But I think the way we envision um, digitization within the restitution process is digitization on many levels. So the first one would be digitization or digital access or, or an understanding of the restitution process itself. So what we're doing with a project um, that I founded called Open Restitution Africa is to say that it's very important to understand what is happening within restitution. It's very important to map how many returns are happening. It's important to know how, what has been returned, where it has come from, who has returned it, where it has gone. So there's also the aspect of restitution data. This is data about the restitution process, you know? And what we are seeing is that there's a very um, dangerous uh, precedent for the erasure of African contributions because this is not what, when we, when we encounter information on restitution online, we often encounter it in the news in response to something. So the British Museum has denied or the German, uh, a German uh, museum has done this. But the narrative does not focus on the perspective of African practitioners, African specialists, the work that Jerry is doing in, in, in um, recontextualizing and reintegrating these objects. So the data about restitution is very important for us to, to know who are the key players, what is happening, and to have an understanding of the general trends and shifts that are taking place. So that's the first role of digitization, to provide access to the data about restitution, Process of, process of restitution is also another thing in the sense that um, Satabao had mentioned that um, when they approached um, restitution, when they approached restitution, it was not from the point of museum experts. They were approaching it from people who work outside the museum. And I think that's another thing that we need to really, really focus on is how do we make information about restitution accessible at different levels of the public at different specialist levels. So it not, it's not just a specialist conversation that happens in diplomatic circles or in museum or just a public conversation, but how do we make sure that this data is accessible to people at different levels? So that's the second thing in terms of digitizing and understanding the process and data around restitution. And then there's the digitization of the objects that we mentioned, um, digitization of artifacts, and this can go a long way in providing access to information. So there's a project by the Women's History Museum of Zambia, and they're building a digital platform in collaboration with a museum in Sweden. So they're looking at um, digital restitution as the first step in a, a much longer physical restitution process. But what they're doing is saying that the significant gaps in the inventories in the Swedish museum, we don't know in the same, in sim, similar to what um, Setabao has said and what Jerry has said, that we have significant knowledge gaps in inventories, in captioning, in, in provenance that we need to address. So digitization can go a long way in making sure that 
we understand exactly what these objects were called, even in the first place, what their names are, where they were used. And I think in the nature of crowdsourcing and contribution, digitization sort of enables that process. And then finally, looking at digitization as a way to encourage and drive policy once information is accessible at, at a government level, at a specialist level, and the public level, we can begin to build sort of like a critical mass understanding of restitution. And the more people know about it, the more people are engaged with the subject, the more pressure there is to create and, and, and define policy for restitution. So we're seeing digitization as this very big um, and digital infrastructure as enabling the restitution process in several aspects, in access, in transparency, in centralizing data, in making sure data is accessible, but also in making sure that we understand that restitution is something that is active within the African continent. You know, people are speaking about this. People have been working on this project for a very long time. People have been asking for artifacts pre-independence. You know, so we are saying that this is something that is very active and, and just because it's not online or just because we don't encounter it every day or we don't see this information everywhere doesn't mean that people aren't working in the background. So, I mean, the digitization process is, is long. It covers very many aspects, but it's very critical to the restitution discussion as a whole. That's so interesting. So, like, are, you're saying that people have been talking about this and have been trying to do this in terms mm. of this is not a new endeavor. People have been talking about it outside of the circles. Is this also like in terms of your uh, work with open restitution, do you feel like every time you present the idea of restitution, people resonate with it? Like, like your typical Kenyan person, do you feel like they generally feel like restitution is important just in terms of your work, in terms of the things that you founded for this very work? Do you feel like it's something that Kenyans are interested in? I think it's something Kenyans are very interested in, but I think we also have to look at the legacies, the legacy of colonialism and imperialism and how it has shaped how we view our history. So while we might say Kenyans don't think this is important, why don't they think this is important? Because we have been separated from an understanding of this history very deliberately. We are separated by the fact that these objects are not there. We're separated by the fact that this is not in the curriculum. We're separated by the fact that, you know, so there's so many levels of separation that I think that even um, a lack of understanding about restitution is itself speaking to why restitution is important. So whether or not people say that this is important or not, I think we have to also understand that we are working within a container where there have been set conditions that have made sure that people think in a certain way. So that's how I see, um, I don't see it. If, if I walked up to someone today and they say they don't think restitution is important, that is also a response to the environment that we find ourselves in, the past that we have had and the nature of the violence that we have faced and um, a massive continual perpetual conditioning. Um, yes. So in, when you said lack of understanding, that reminded me of something Elena said in the film as well. Elena, you were talking about where, uh, when you guys were setting up the installation, you were scared that the people um, would be offended. The, the, the word you used was offended. Why did you feel like they, would, they might be offended? Yeah, what I was afraid of is that we didn't bring back the original, so we were not able to, and all we got was a cheap copy. So we made a um, installation and we made a 3D scan, but of course um, one might feel offended because why are you bringing me this ghost and not like the real flesh of it? So um, this is something I would ask myself maybe like... Um, but in the end, um, maybe this was also not that bad because we opened a total different layer through this. So it's cynical, but uh, the cynical um, makes this absence even more graphic, even, even more um, visible. So mm -hmm. yes, but I was afraid about the reaction of the people who might feel offended by the fact that they cannot um, even with our film or with the journey, they cannot even now access or see it. They All we can bring them is this installation. Yeah, and I found, I found watching the reactions of people to the installation so interesting, especially how many times it was mentioned in the film that uh, someone was asking Saitabao, Are you, do you want to take me back to the ocean? I was like, that is, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain how that made me feel. Let me try because I'm a writer. <laughs> it felt like there were layers of history or trauma that were kind of 
duplicated into the psyche of people such that when something strange is coming, your first reaction is, are you going to harm me? Because a lot of people were saying the object should come back. You guys, the filmmakers can correct me if, if I'm wrong, if I get the text wrong. You can bring the objects back as long as they will not cause harm. Because somehow we feel like, you know, things that are coming from the ocean or things that are new that we have not had before that you want to bring to us now will bring us harm. And that feels like layers of, of history and trauma just because it's been a long time since people came from the ocean to come and harm us, but we still relate to things and objects in that same way. Um, so I said, well, maybe you can speak on how that made you feel a little bit. Clearly it made me feel a lot. Um, I don't know how it made you, that traumatized me a little bit, I confess. Yeah, uh, it also a bit slightly traumatized me just a little bit, but um, it was very interesting. First of all, I find, especially because uh, we, we were shooting in the rural area, it is very interesting how people talk. There's a so certain poetic aspect to it, you know? And uh, just saying, take me to the ocean, like, like you said, there are so many layers, but also um, there are so many things that can be deconstructed from just that one phrase. Like for example, like you said, uh, African societies have a very interesting relationships with the oceans because there's the spirits oceans and everything. Uh, but how you interpret it, for instance, I would say, uh, take me to the ocean because this is the first point of contact. Like when it comes to colonialism, the Europeans, came through the ocean at the time they sailed and they came through the ocean so that's why african societies can be uh they can be a bit strange when it comes to uh, the ocean but also when we talked to the people especially the elderly um it's something that i we kind of realized um they've been alienated you know, it's an object that belongs to their community, but they've been alienated. They do not understand. They feel that the objects will harm them. And this goes back to colonialism. Uh, in 1920, for instance, the British government imposed the uh, witchcraft law. And they said, you know, some of these practices are considered witchcraft. And uh, so it kind of made the mindset, it made the people of Kenya, for instance, to believe that their customary tradition and practices are considered witchcraft. And for instance, uh, some of these objects were used for spiritual purposes and even for cultural purposes. So it is something to do with also uh, colonialism and the mindset of the people, hence why you could feel they felt this object could harm, to, could harm me. So this says a lot about uh, how how uh, colonial, colonialism really affected and impacted, especially uh, Kenyans during that period. And this is between, you can say between the 1900s towards the 60s. Um, and maybe I can bounce this question back to Njeri. How many objects do we have kind of in, the, in our national museums collections that do not belong to Africans? So, what I'm saying is Western civilizations have a lot of African artifacts, African cultural objects. How many do we have from there? Does that, does that make sense? Wow, that's a tricky question, Abigail. I did not foresee it, uh, but I think, uh, I, I mean, if we were to do a, a comparison of a kind, we do have a bit of, uh, you know, cultural objects that we can say for sure, like from the Oman for the Arab, uh, the Arab world, the Oman Arabs because of our interactions, uh, sure. and uh, a little bit, of course, with the archaeological collection, what we can say, like what has been ex excavated, uh, like in the coast recently from the 14th century, we could be having some porcelain that definitely are from maybe in maybe. Uh, China, um, I may not have an exact number, but of course, I know where you're headed to. We cannot, there's no comparison between what we have from other cultures with what other cultures, especially the European uh, countries have from us. There can be no comparison at all. And uh, why, we, why, why this, this is uh, the case is that, uh, of course, we have the issues of the interaction. We interacted and remember, we were interacting at different levels. 
So of course, there has been always the question of how the objects were acquired because the IIP was very keen to look into objects and the provenance, check on how the objects ended up where they are. Of course, there's been that you can check on the catalog and say this object was acquired, what you can say legally, because there was an exchange of a kind or it was sold at a certain amount of money. But of course, when we go back, you have to ask yourself, so of course we do have some that were taken at gunpoint. We do have that and it's do documented. But even those ones that were exchanged at what you would call our, you know, like a business kind of, you know, we say uh, it was like a, a kind of a mutual kind of exchange. It was not mutual because people were not at par. We were dealing with different power relations. So definitely there was no equality of a kind. So uh, for instance, uh, I, I would like to touch on the issue of what Sajabao is talking about, the issues of how Kenyans and or like the community that went in the Kikuyu relate and how they relate with the ocean. Uh, in that kind of culture there, I would just like, I can only say that the issue of the ocean is relating to evil. There's this thought that every anything evil, uh, like the evil spirits live in the ocean. So why that is, is because for those ones that were taken and they were ritualistic objects, we do have ritualistic objects, objects that were for certain rituals like circumcision, objects that were for certain issues, healing, healing kind of objects. They were taken away, but remember how they were taken away? It was a simple, it was as easy as you do have this object. It is very important. Of course, I think somebody must have known it was very important. But then, of course, there was the issue of introducing a new religion. So it was a matter of making you live what you believe in and then start believing in something else. So if today there's an issue of belief and the belief systems of the people. So if I, I kind of moved from this kind of religion to another, of course, I had to be have an, a whole call, an, an, an indoctrination of a kind for me to know that that religion I'm living must be evil. So anything coming from that part of that religion is evil and it's really, really sad. I, I watched that video and of course that statement really kind of just finished me. It's one of those things you can really not really like understand how I, somebody can be so detached from what belongs to them. So in short, what I'm saying is that we cannot compare, like of course the objects that are out there definitely are, are so much more than we can ever, ever imagine. Of course, we cannot compare what we have here that is not ours is very little and it's simply because of the issue of power relations and how these exchanges were taken, how they were taking place. Yeah, um, that indoctrination thing also also really affected me. Um, there's also a segment in, in the movie that um, Elena and Setebo made that talks about, so there's people who are looking at the exhibit and someone says, this is a cliche representation of Africa, right? So um, they've put up an exhibit and it's supposed to be an African market. And I think it's the lady that you guys were talking about, the head of the Stuttgart Museum, who was like, what do we what do we mean when we say an African market? What is an African market even? So sometimes it feels like the things that they're putting up in the museums are not even what Africa is anymore. And it's like, what exactly are you are you keeping? What is what is this for? Um, I'm running out of time for my questions, guys. <laughs> um, I think I think before I completely completely run out of time, I should probably ask how you feel this movie has this short film has contributed to to what goal you were trying to achieve by making it right um maybe the filmmakers can answer that for us like do you feel like it's had a positive impact do you feel like there's more to be done do you feel like you said what you were trying to say um yeah <laughs> Yeah, I can say that the, for us, it was a journey. So we were just starting. And um, I think for this particular story, we found answers. But from the whole discussion, this tiny film is just like a small piece in the beginning. So I think that our journey has come to an end. We found what we were looking for, but the discussion has just started. Like, And of course, it's going on for um, a long time already, but like um, with this film, it's nothing that we can now close the chapter and say, okay, we've done it. But I really want to use this film as a tool to open new dialogues and new discussions. So I think, um, yes, we learned a lot, but now is where the action should start now. So how can we use this film? And how can we use our position of um, reaching people 
to maybe talk to schools about this issue or to have it in lessons to have some kind of events like this just to maybe even use the installation or to put an open more dialogue in more spaces so this is what um, is interesting to me right now um, so okay we've done this what what next what not what now <laughs> yeah Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I think um, for us as storytellers, because um, uh, for us, we kind of sort of opened the discussion in a different light. The discussion has been there constantly, but sort of use the power of film, you know, to kind of uh, light uh, the whole situation and the whole uh, debate and for us it was more like the positive aspect is like just to show what what we know is just a drop what we don't know is an entire ocean and so we we are able to have this discussion and have it openly and then uh, come to face to face with the realities and how to move next and specifically when we chose the title if objects could speak i would say for our standpoint the objects spoke to us and the objects are speaking and it is also we're using the film sort of to a bit cut, uh, catapult the whole discussion and come up with new solutions and new ways to you know have restitution uh, um, uh, attention have people get people's attention when it comes to restitution. Um, I think, you know, it's of course immediately apparent that the easiest way to continue these conversations to spark them if we can't all, you know, make films or have installations or do that um, amount of work to kind of get the word out is, um, is to do these things online. So maybe Chow, you can talk a little bit about um, your work in terms of getting more people to talk about it, like with your, um, the things you founded the things that you talk about, the conversations that you have regularly and how people can kind of be a part of that to kind of um, amplify the message. I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably just begin by saying that uh, restitution, restitution of objects is also, I think, very much a restitution of knowledge. You know, we are saying that we need to return the center of knowledge or to understand that this, who we are as a people, what we have as communities, what we have as a society, we are the custodians of the knowledge about these objects. And we, even when we don't understand them and even when we have no access to them, our links to them, as Saitabao has said, that if these objects could speak, what would they say? And how do we listen to them? We think that is the job of, of those of us who have to receive these objects when we come back, who have to reintegrate them into society, who have to do the painful job of reframing our mindset, you know? And I think, I look at digital technology and digital platforms as a key way of doing this, of, of gathering um, different narratives, alternative narratives, of reimagining what this could look like. When we talk about how we can visualize these objects, we can build worlds, we can build entire worlds through animation, through games, through um, different interactive platforms. And I think if we start understanding and asking ourselves, how do we recontextualize this, this objects and this material today, because I think the job of technology is not just to help us, um, uh, you know, in the future, but also to help us reimagine the past for ourselves, specifically as Africans. And a lot of the initiatives that I work on look at um, technology, but also really encouraging public participation within different aspects. So with public participation, with um, contextualization of objects, public participation with um, digitization of objects, how do we make sure that things like digitization or even skills such as digitization are accessible to people from different levels, you know, because this is, this is becoming a skill that we certainly need as a society and we, we need to understand how do we do it in a holistic way that doesn't replicate the biases of the of the real world. And I think one of the things that digitization can do also is to help us contextualize the tangible and the intangible. So for example, if we have this drum or this shield, can we contextualize it with the ceremony in which it was used, with the song in which this instru particular instrument um, um, would have been played with a place, you know? So how do we look at the objects as one point in an entire ecosystem of people, landscape, archives, there's so much around it. And I think digital media in the way it enables us to combine information, 
really gives us access and, and the imagination to build these worlds and to recreate them for ourselves and an understanding of ourselves. The way you said restitution of knowledge and, and everything that you said after that kind of makes it sound like it's, uh, it's, a, it's a problem on many levels in terms of it's a cultural problem and it's an education mm -hmm. problem. And even both, it's a cultural education problem. So when, when we're going to shags, <laughs> when we're going up to our upcountry homes and the conversations we're having and what is no longer being told to us that would have been told to us when we would go see our grandparents and mm -hmm. sit around the fire, what they would be telling us. Where we have an education problem in terms of what we're learning in school, as Saita Bao said, the object that we have no idea what they're for, but they're ours. How can you fix an education problem? Is that for me? <laughs> it's for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's a rhetorical wow. question, actually. I did, yeah, that's yeah. a rhetorical question. Um, and speaking of public participation, yeah, um, and Jerry, there's something you said about um, how, the, uh, how the NMK, how the National Museums has, uh, not movements, uh, there's initiatives to try and get the public to, to talk about these and to know about these. Where, what are those initiatives exactly? Could you expound on that a little bit? Wow, thank you very much, Abigail. I know there's so many questions that keep coming to mind. And of course, yeah, we really have to keep asking ourselves like how we can fix our education system and, and the mindset. But well, yeah, that's a really big question. Yes, the National Museums of Kenya are just like uh, the Open Restitution has uh, worked not uh, alone. We are working in partnership with the RJM Museum in Cologne and the Western Museum in uh, in Frankfurt, I'm sorry, I can never pronounce those German names. They're very difficult for me. And the Shift Collection and then uh, Collective, which is uh, the team members based in uh, France and Kenya. And the next collective are uh, who are based in Kenya and uh, Saudi and thinking about uh, the movement and having a conversation. And other than that, we are of course working together with the Gota Institute and they've been very grace, graceful and with, your time, with their time and of course and their resources, uh, we've been funded by the Gota Institute uh, in, in, in Germany and uh, the German Federal Cultural Foundation. And uh, the, the, main, the main thing that we have tried to do for the last, like say now two and a half years is, is to try and create a lot of, you know, you make a a lot of noise. We've held what we call object movement dialogues. Uh, we've had seven of them where we invite different kind of people to come and talk about objects and these things are, are, are in the public. And of course, uh, because of the issues of COVID, they've been uh, virtual and they are available within our websites. We've had people talking about their experiences and what they would like to see. And for us, that has been the, the, the greatest, one of the greatest achievements. Of course, somebody asked me the other day whether we've been able to bring one object home. And unfortunately, we've not been able to bring a single object home as per now out of this initiative. But we are having a conversation and we've also been able to loop in the community members, the owners of this collection, the owners of this knowledge we are talking about. And we know what they would like to see and what their feelings are. Uh, we've also been able to, um, to uh, do the exhibition, which is, uh, as I say, trying to give a, a snap, a, a just a, a snapshot of what things look like. Because with the exhibition, we have actually talked about the subject of absence and what it means, not in our own uh, in our own words, but in the words of the community, how what that absence is and what it means, which is really deep. And I really this is a call for anyone who may have not had an opportunity to visit this exhibition, which has run since uh, mid March. It was extended up to 30th May, and this was due to uh, public demand. We were supposed to have wound up this exhibition and moved on to Frankfurt, but we to Cologne, sorry, but we had to extend the exhibition for one month. But what what I'm telling you is that, of course, we may not seem to be doing so much because we've not had like one object come out of this initiative. Of course, we know there are objects that have come before. We've had um, situations or we have had opportunities where. Uh, a whole lot of objects have been brought back to Kenya, especially recently, about two years ago, we had the return of what community are currently now thinking about how they are going to do what they're calling the, the cleansing rituals and be able to integrate those objects within the community where they belong.
Jerry? Jerry For me, just think. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Being able to see a uh, lot of people walk into the exhibition space and ask a lot of questions, uh, getting a lot of booked tours that are organized specifically for that exhibition. And even the fact that Kenyans want this exhibition to happen and to continue, for me, that is a great achievement. Just providing that platform is something great where we can have so many people talking about what is happening out there. And when you talk about the database, we are hoping to be able to make it public very soon uh, once we've had uh, negotiations that agreed with the museums that they are ready to have their database go on you know the public we will have it hosted within the national museums of kenya website right so the so the exhibition is over it's ongoing it's going on till 30th of may so you still have uh, about okay exactly 30th of may yes Okay, um, so yeah, okay, that's fantastic. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about how you spent this last hour, but I feel very happy about it. Um, maybe you guys, uh, as we close off, you can tell us where we can find you. Tell us where we can find the film, first of all. Give us um, your social media handles if people have questions where they can find you, especially um, you know, in terms of finding the film, in terms of engaging with the national muse museums, in terms of who they should follow uh, to have conversations about digitization. Uh, maybe Elena, you can start. Yes, we are sending right now the film to other festivals. So we just, um, we had it last week um, at Freiburg and Nairobi, it was um, a junction film festival. And now um, also doing panel discussions like this. And um, we have a film page, it's just called ifobjectscouldspeak.com. And um, the same with Instagram. So we have if objects could speak as uh, Instagram. Um, I think there's more information, more footage, trailer, everything. Um, if people want to have a look, then they can also um, find the film and find more about us as directors. Okay, and your social media handles? Uh, my social media? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah, yeah it's, um, I'm also on Instagram, um, so you can reach me there. Um, it's just my name, Elena Schilling, with uh, uh, the, the Elena Schilling, so you can find me there, yeah. Okay, um, uh, Yeah, uh, my personal, um, uh, social media accounts are uh, Instagram, it's at Kayare, and on Facebook, it's at Saitabao Kayare, and on Twitter, it's at Ole Kayare. Okay. If you had said Saitabao Kayare again, I was going to be like, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerry, how can people engage with you and engage with the museums? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you can engage with the museum. We do have, we are available. You can visit our website, the National Museums of Kenya, and it has all uh, the, 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 the hashtag, the Instagram account is also available at National at Museums of Kenya. We have the invent, in, Invisible Inventory Program uh, website, which is available within National Museums of Kenya, within Gota Institute. Also, you can just search Invisible Inventory Program and kindly catch a, a glance of the exhibition before it closes. Mm -hmm. And you can also reach me um, within uh, Twitter. My account is at Jerry Gashini. Thank All you. All right, Chow, over to you. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. It had to happen before the end of the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can find my work at headstronghistorian.com. Uh, on Instagram, I'm also Headstrong Historian. On Twitter, Headstrong Historian. And uh, uh, my organizational profile is African Digital Heritage. And from there, you can find all the other profiles. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for engaging in uh, an open and honest way about the film, restitution, everything, all of the issues. I really hope that... Um, I will see you guys on other panels and, and you will have be having personal panels in your hearts and with people in your households and in your circles and in your communities about all of this wonderful stuff that we've talked about today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for Thanks inviting us. us.
<laughs> all right, guys. I think we can um, we can close the panel now. That's that that's all we have for you today. Um, to the audience, thank you for joining. You've heard all of the social media handles, and you know where you can see the films and continue to engage in the European Film Festival and with the Go to Institute programs. Let us know how you feel about uh, what we've been talking about, and join us on the next panel slash film slash discussion slash installation slash everything. Thank you.